Hello from the UK. Apologies that I can't join you all in Bishkek this year for what is, I'm sure, a great conference in an amazing location. However, I still wanted to present our research and would invite anyone who's interested in it to follow up with me via email or social media. All my contact information is on all the slides as well as at the end. This particular piece of research is one that I collaborated on with one of my master's students, Betty Wan, and focuses on cross-cultural comparisons between American and Chinese reactions to crises. Now, to set the, the plate for this research a little bit, um, last year I decided to try and develop as accurate of a summary of the state of crisis communication as I could, reviewing all the journal articles that I could find with the earliest emerging in 1953 through to the end of 2015. So over these last 60 years of study, we certainly see growth in the field of crisis communication, but to give you a snapshot of these results, they show a really strong skew towards North America in the research. But it's when we take a look at the map that we get a much clearer picture of what's going on. So let me put this in perspective. Of the 690 journal articles that I found, 417 focused on the U.S. Now, not necessarily exclusively the U.S., because many focused on other countries as well. However, if a piece of research included the United States, it was significantly less likely to include comparisons to almost any other country. 126 of the articles focus on Europe as a region, with particular spikes in the UK, Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden. 71 articles focus on Asia, with the majority of these emphasizing China. 21 of them represent Australasia, with a larger focus on Australia. And then we get down to the least addressed regions. The Middle East, South and Central America, each with having only six articles addressing them, and only eight articles looking at the entirety of the continent of Africa. So from the side of crisis communication, the need to think globally isn't just a matter of commercial viability, but of also filling a much needed research gap. But the research itself certainly is increasing in the field of crisis communication. And finding that perceptions of an organization's ethics are driven by culture and differences in trust perceptions. Though crisis communication has been increasingly studied in the last couple of decades, its focus has still been on organizational responses and not necessarily differing ways that publics react to crisis messages or even the crises themselves. So in recent years, however, the emotions and factors affecting public's reactions to crises have been increasingly studied and have ranged from medium-related issues like media channel and agenda setting to psychological-based discussions with cognitive appraisals and involvement in crisis issues. However, little attention has been paid to self-other perceptual gaps, which do closely relate to media and crisis influence as well. Simply stated, the self-other perceptual gap asks the question of how does the crisis affect me? And how do I believe that a crisis affects others? So therefore, this study's purpose was to begin to fill this research gap, both in terms of cultural understanding, as well as by studying the self-other perceptual gap by comparing reactions in two relatively different cultures. So if we take a look at our stu core study variables, on the independent variables side, we took a look at country first. So we wanted to make sure that we compared countries that were well studied and also very different. Therefore, it made sense to focus on the US and China. Second, we also wanted to focus, focus on crisis response strategy. There's been a great deal of research examining differences in crisis response strategies. However, one of the pr primary comparisons that's often used in crisis research is the defensive accommodative continuum of response strategies. On the defensive end of the continuum, the message strategies aim to distance the organization from the responsibility and blame of the crisis through tactics like directly denying responsibility, 
attacking the accuser, or even looking for excuses. On the other end of the continuum, accommodative strategies tend to focus on accepting responsibility and working to accommodate stakeholders' demands about the crisis and also ways to rectify harms done. Our dependent variables, we focus on three. First, of course, is the self-other perceptions. Naturally, this is one of the critical factors that we wanted to analyze, sometimes referred to as first and third person effects in persuasion research. The simple questions here focus on how much an individual believes the crisis affects them personally versus how much the same person believes the crisis or the crisis response messages are likely to affect other people. The self perceptual gap occurs when attributions of the self versus others differ substantially. So people who believe that crises affect themselves m much more might certainly be physically closer to a crisis, but it can also be the result of other psychographic factors like efficacy, fear control, and danger control processes. Second, negative word of mouth, or NWAM, is often used as an indicator of displeasure and is strongly connected with third-person research. Um, the concept of schadenfreude, that is feeling happy when an, an organization suffers when it's in trouble, has long been connected with reputational problems in crisis response. However, in studies of third-person effects, when blame attribution is greater, there is a much stronger belief that the crisis will affect other people more resulting in more negative discussions about the organization. However, it's less clear about this when, when the first person is affected more. Also then, third, is the social desirability of messages. Naturally, within a multicultural context, recognizing whether communication behaviors by an organization are viewed as aligning with social norms and culturally accepted standards is important. In third-person studies, the same is true. It's a measure of whether the message is viewed as, as acceptable. However, one of the interesting features of the self-other perceptual gap is that people often believe that others are much more likely to be influenced by socially undesirable messages than the self will be. In essence, I'm confident that I can resist inappropriate messages, but I worry that other people can't. Now, in doing cross-cultural research, it is important to find an industry that most people are familiar with, probably have experiences with as well. The airline industry was per particularly good for this experiment. Um, the data was collected in 2015 and right at a point that the airline industry had just faced a number of crises, including the crash of the German wings flight by its co-pilot in France, the mysterious disappearance of the Malaysian Airlines plane, and to also including broader questions about health and safety when flying because of EMERS and Ebola transmittal concerns in Asia, Europe, and the U.S. In addition, there were a host of stories about weapons and drugs being smuggled worldwide on well-known carriers that had been reported in the news. The IATA, the governing organization for um, air and traffic safety, happens to cite crises that focus on health and safety as being the ones that airlines are also more susceptible to. So in this case, we wanted to focus on this type of a concern and how stakeholders, people would react um, to airlines and health and safety concerns. So respondents were shown fictitious stories about weapons smuggling or disease spread through air travel. Embedded within these stories was either a defensive or accommodative response from the airline. In order to maximize the potential effects, we also made sure that the airlines were top or really well-known carriers in the country. Uh, to give a little bit of a perspective on who our participants were, we had 699 Chinese participants and 315 American respondents. Um, the Chinese sample was obtained through Snowball Convenience Sampling, and the American respondents were obtained through a Qualtrics panel.
Participants, though, were randomly assigned to the experiment condition, but we ended up with a really nice, diverse group of, of respondents, varying in age ranges from 18 to 82, and also included a relatively even uh, proportion of men and women in the, uh, in the participation. So our key findings, there are three big areas of findings. And to be honest, the results are a bit of a mixed bag. One of the most important findings, though, is that culture plays a vital role in moderating perceptions of a crisis response message's social desirability and also magnifying the self-perceptual gap. So this substantially affected both the magnitude and direction of the first and third person effects. Um, there weren't strong effects, though, on this particular accommodative and defensive strategies, though. So let's take a look at them a little bit more closely. Initially, in terms of the third-person effects at the onset of a crisis, in these findings, the initial onset of a health and safety crisis itself didn't affect people's perceptions that they were susceptible to the effects of the crisis. Similarly, when we separated out friends and family from people in other regions or other countries, there was a significant third-person effect for those who were more removed from the self. That is to say that at the onset of a crisis, reports of disease being brought into the country, for example, via air travel, people don't feel like they or their close friends and family are at greater risk. However, they do believe that other people, increasing with physical and emotional distance from themselves, are likely to be at risk. This does suggest some potentially interesting insights into risk appraisals in non-emergency crisis situations, that quite frankly, people may not take news of these types of crises as seriously in terms of the personal impact. This can help to explain why any particular crisis response strategy may not be as effective. If a, a stakeholder simply is not emotionally engaged in a crisis, how the organization responds is probably going to be less important when there isn't that strong emotional connection to the issue itself. Second, when we look at social desirability and re response strategies, as we get into this result, it is actually important to note the manipulation check to establish whether the accommodative and defensive messages themselves were viewed as appropriately accommodative or defensive was successful. The messages themselves were written based on well-established literature and characteristics on accommodative versus defensive messages. So from a research standpoint, there was no problem. And because of the outcomes, we definitely checked. So when we compare the social desirability of accommodative and defensive messages, we found no significant impact. However, we also measured perceptions of accommodativeness and defensiveness in the messages and found a strong set of correlations. If a crisis response message was viewed as accommodative, then it was viewed as socially desirable. On the other hand, if a message was viewed as defensive, it was viewed as socially undesirable. In this case, because the crisis onset didn't trigger significant personal anxiety reactions in the participants, it's very possible that the engagement with the crisis response messages themselves were a bit muted. Since the people didn't perceive that the crisis affected them, they weren't moved by the response strategy. But this is definitely something that needs to be further developed, and certainly with the perception of the accommodativeness and defensiveness in crisis response tied to personal investment and response strategies themselves. Next, like with the findings for social desirability, there was no significant finding for the accommodative and defensive messages themselves in terms of behavioral intent and response strategies. However, there were very powerful findings with regard to negative word of mouth intentions with messages that respondents perceived as defensive. Very directly, if a respondent perceives a crisis response message from an organization as being defensive, they are significantly more likely to speak negatively about that organization 
the crisis and how the organization's handling that crisis than if the response itself was perceived as being accommodative. This accounts for roughly 25% of the variance in people's intentions to say something negative or to advocate against the organization. So to us, the implication is quite clear. An organization needs to ensure that its crisis response messages are not perceived as defensive. When the organization intends to communicate, that doesn't actually matter. It's about the perception of defensiveness or perhaps a lack of sincerity that's enough to create a reputational crisis within the crisis itself. Certainly more research into the factors that lead stakeholders to the perception of defensiveness needs to be conducted, but it is certainly an interesting finding. And with that, we also get into the cultural differences in social desirability. In this case, it's really clear that a prototypically Western approach to crisis response messages needs to be re-examined when it comes to Chinese audiences. There are several studies that demonstrate a strong difference between the favorability, broadly speaking, of accommodative and defensive responses in crisis situations. And naturally, there are some caveats. However, in the cases of these types of crises, where an organization is not directly to a blame, accommodative responses are typically viewed much more favorably than defensive responses. These findings were generally confirmed for the U.S. respondents, however not for the Chinese respondents. In fact, there were no significant differences between the social desirability and the two types of messages for Chinese respondents. And the messages themselves Overall, no matter which type it was, were viewed as socially inappropriate or undesirable. These data suggest that a stronger set of investigations into culturally appropriate crisis responses and even perhaps source credibility for Chinese stakeholders is necessary if organizations want to be more successful in managing crises in China. Then, when we also examine the cultural differences in the self-other gap, previous research suggested that collectivist cultures would have a lower self-other perceptual gap when compared to individualistic cultures. Therefore, in a crisis context, it was expected that the same trend would follow. This hypothesis was strongly confirmed, that the gap between what Chinese respondents believe directly affects them versus others is substantially narrower compared to Americans. This suggests that the type of arguments that can be made in crisis response, focusing on collective needs for action, alignment of values, and the like are all more possible with Chinese stakeholders compared to American ones. However, these findings may also explain the relative levels of cynicism demonstrated in the social desirability evaluations of different types of crisis response messages, because Chinese publics have a narrower self-other perceptual gap, crises are more personal, even if they're not directly affected. So organizations or industries that fail them have a higher reputational hole to climb back out of, even if they're not personally effective. On the other side, because Americans feel a relative disconnect from people in other regions or other countries, if crises occur that don't immediately affect them, they are more willing to move on from the crisis because it's not personal. So, with that, um, I welcome any kinds of questions, comments, and feedback. Don't hesitate to contact me. You can also see the presentation and comment um, on my website. Have a great conference.